Gonzalo, welcome back home. Thank you. It's our pleasure to have you here today. Um, well, uh, you were one of our first students back in, I don't know, 2015 or something. Uh, yeah, I started in tw uh, 2011. 2011, so 2019. he did the bachelor with us, the master, the PhD also under the guidance of Oscar Manolo. And, and then he moved uh, to the MIT in Boston. And it's been already two years in a postdoc there. Uh, we, we met in, in summertime and we're discussing about many things. Uh, and then I invited him to come here. I thought it would, it would be nice to see what he's doing. Also, it would be nice for our students to see, you know, um, a colleague uh, being what he has seen, what he has done overseas. Maybe uh, we can also explore. Uh, well, we can get to talk after after the talk. Uh, there will there will be a snack. Uh, if you want to ask him anything about how life is in, <laughs> in the United States and, and what type of opportunities you might find there, I think that's the one of the ideas of today. And also to, to get to see what you are doing, I, I think um, it's going to be quite interesting. Uh, you're going to be talking about a subgrid scale model for large eddy simulations using building blocks, mm -hmm. which I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, but um, for use, thank you very much for being here today. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, I'm glad to be back and see some familiar faces and many new faces. Uh, I, as Manuel mentioned, uh, well, first of all, we can talk uh, during the snack, but also I'm gonna be here until Friday. So if you have questions, we can discuss in actually in Manuel Sanjurjo's uh, office. So feel free to come by. Uh, and actually today I'm gonna be talking about the SAPID scale model for large day simulations using building block flows that I'm gonna explain what a building block is. Uh, but also working on information theory. So if you are interested in any of those topics, feel free to, uh, to come by and we can discuss. Um, before starting, I'm gonna acknowledge my colleagues. So first of all, Adrian, he is the PI of, uh, um, the PI of this project. Uh, Juenon and Emily, uh, the three of us were from the very beginning involved in this project. We were initially funded by NASA and we developed the first version of this aggregate scale model during the summer program at Stanford. And now we are being funded by Boeing and Sam is a new addition. Uh, the things that I'm gonna be presenting, Sam hasn't been part uh, of, but he's right now implementing the model in GPU, which is a very welcome uh, addition. So without further uh, more introduction, I'm gonna split this talk uh, with an introduction and a motivation. Why are we building this model? I'm gonna explain the model and I'm gonna show two applications uh, to cases that are actually relevant uh, for the industry. And I'm just gonna uh, finish with some conclusions. So the main motivation is the need of the industry of uh, trying to reduce the number of experiments that they have to uh, run in the aerospace industry to certify a new aircraft. What they wanna do is to uh, change, replace these experiments by numerical simulations, which in principle are gonna be cheaper and gonna take less time than running an experiment. The problem is that to do that, you need your uh, simulation to be something that you can trust, that you can rely on the results. And right now, the challenge is that we don't have any CFD model, any computational free dynamic model that is able to consistently and accurately predict the complex flows that you have over an aircraft. Uh, with, within the framework of industry, with the resources and the time that they are uh, dealing with. And when you wonder why, well, basically if you try to solve uh, the flow over an aircraft, in fluid mechanics, we are very lucky because we have some equations that we, we can solve. Uh, here I'm showing the incompressible, uh, the, the equation for incompressible fluid. The, here we have the uh, mass conservation and the momentum conservation. I'm using the Einstein notation. As usual, I guess that you are familiar with, you have U is the velocity, P, P the pressure, and nu the, uh, the uh, laminar, uh, the kinematic viscosity, and SIJ is the strain, uh, uh, the rate of strain tensor, which basically includes the derivatives of the velocity. So we have the equations, we can discretize it, we have numerical methods to solve it, uh, so we can solve it and actually is what we have been doing. So for example, we can solve for the flow uh, in a turbulent channel flow. I guess you are familiar with it, but a channel flow, you have two walls and then the flow is driven by a pressure gradient in the string wave direction. Here uh, I'm showing a channel flow with a Reynolds number based on the friction velocity at the wall equal to 1000. And I'm plotting the uh, uh, 
magnitude of the vorticity. Uh, so what is the problem? Well, there is always a catch, and in this case, it's turbulence. So as you may know, turbulence is a multi-scale problem. Uh, what happens is that you have what they are called eddies, they are regions of the flow which have a coherent motion, and they, we have from very large motions to very small scales, very small uh, motions. And as we increase the Reynolds number, based on some characteristic velocity and uh, length, the difference between the largest scale and the smallest scale is bigger. And you have to solve for all the scales. You have to have a grid that is fine enough to account for the smallest scale. And this, what happens is that when you try to increase the Reynolds number, since the difference in the scale increases, the number of points that you need in your simulation grows with the Reynolds number to the power almost of three. And the issue is that when you move to, okay, I'm gonna solve the flow over an aircraft, the Reynolds number in a commercial aircraft is very big. So actually what you can solve with this uh, kind of resources for DNS, it's only like a few millimeters of the wind and it will take like months. So it's something that we cannot do. We are not able to run a DNS of the, of the full aircraft. So we have to think of a workaround. And one uh, thing that you may think of is, OK, let's try to reduce the number of points that we need. <laughs> and a very straightforward approach is like, OK, I'm just going to use a coarse grid. OK, so here you see the flow solved with DNS. But now I'm going to try to solve it with a coarse grid. So I only have information at the center of this grid. OK, this is usually called filter, the filter Navier-Stokes equation. And it's called filter because what I'm going to have basically at every point is going to be like the average of the velocity that I will have if I will have all the scales. So it's like applying a filter. This is my real flow. I'm going to apply a filter with a width of the size of the grid. And I'm going to make like an average. Here I'm showing the filter Navier-Stokes equation. They are the same. I'm using this overline to denote filter quantities. And as you can see, they are exactly the same equations, but I have this additional term. This SGS stands for subgrid scale. And this term is something that I have to model that I don't know. And it has to account for all the information that I'm missing when I have this, this grid. So I have to account for the effect of the small scales that I'm not able to resolve. This is basically LES. So the idea of LES is that I'm only solving for the large scales, which are usually the eddies that contains the energy. It's basically a coarse version of the Navier-Stokes with the addition that I need to find this a model to account for what I'm missing. Okay? There is just another small detail, and it's what happens when you get closer to the wall. So the largest scale that you are going to have here is going to be proportional to the distance to the wall. So what happens is that near these regions or your eddies are going to be small eddies. So the idea of LES is that I want to solve for 80% of the energy of my flow. But the problem is here, you only have relatively a small scale. So if you have a coarse grid, you are not solving for any of the energy. Uh, one thing that you can do is like, OK, I'm going to try to always solve for 80% of the energy. And what I can do is to get a finer grid close to the wall to at least try to solve some of the scales near the wall. The problem, you can do that, and it's done uh, during re uh, in research uh, and uh, ac academy, but the scaling is still uh, almost uh, to the power of two, the, the number of points that you need when you increase the Reynolds number. So it's something that you can do uh, at the university, but the industry cannot afford this. So what can you do instead? It's like, OK, I'm going to have this part under resolve. I'm going to have a relatively coarse grid, OK? Who cares? Uh, but the problem is that if you compute the CL stress, here is going to be completely off because you are missing all that information. So what you need is an additional model for the uh, wall CL stress. And, uh, and this is called wall model LES. And what you do is you have a coarser grid close to the wall. You have an additional model for the wall CL stress in which what you are doing is replacing the non-slip boundary condition by a flux, which is this uh, shear stress that you estimate with information from uh, this, this region here. OK? When you do that, now you, net, you need less points, and now your scaling goes with the Reynolds number. This is something that now the industry can afford. So in this talk, I'm going to be basically focusing in one model LES. I'm going to try to find a model for the subgrid scale tensor and also a model for the wall shear stress. OK? Um, 
And I just want to give a very brief overview of uh, the wall model LEDs that are currently uh, now being uh, used by the industry. Uh, for, the for the wall model, the, we use the equilibrium wall model. Basically, what you have to do is to solve an ODE where you input, as I mentioned before, the uh, information of the velocity at the points that are uh, away from the wall, and you estimate the, the CR stress. And for the circuit scale model, what you want to do is to estimate this circuit scale tensor. And what you assume is that it has the same shape as the diffusion term. Here, instead of having the laminar viscosity, we have this new T, which is called the eddy viscosity. And the models, what they try to do is to uh, find this eddy viscosity. Uh, two very well-known models to find the viscosity are the Smagolinsky model and the Bremen model that I'm not going to uh, talk much about them, but just to, uh, I'm going to refer to them later on, so at least you have the, the names. Uh, in all these, uh, for all these kind of models, the problem is that to derive them, uh, you have to make some assumptions. And usually, you assume equilibrium and some canonical flow. Usually, they are based on the channel flow at equilibrium, where you have the diffusion and the production being in balance. Uh, and the problem now is when you apply to an aircraft, there are many things going on, and these models tend to fail, especially when you have grid resolutions that are about like five to 10 points per boundary layer. The scales are under-resolved, and these models tend to fail. Okay? Uh, and the reason of having these grids is because they are the ones that you can afford by, uh, by the industry. Okay? So we need our model to do well for these kind of grids. <laughs> So what we propose is a new uh, model that is able to account for different kind of flows, separation, attached flow, and so on. It's going to compensate for the numerical errors in our algorithm. We want it to be applicable for complex geometries. That is, has to be simple enough that I can implement the model and run the aircraft. I don't want a very complicated model that can only work with a, a Cartesian grid and the channel flow. So it has to be something that is useful for the industry, basically because also Boeing is funded us, so it's being funded us. So. And finally, we want it to be accurate across different grid resolutions, and in particular, these kind of coarse grids. And of course, we have a model, so we are not going to be able to have exactly the same solution as the uh, Navier-Stokes equation during uh, doing dynamical simulations. So we want our mod a model to do well with two things that are quantities of interest in the industry. One is the average wall shear stress, and the other one is the mean velocity profile. So we're going to try to find a model that is able to predict these two quantities uh, correctly when you are running basically an aircraft. Okay? So this is the objective, and I'm going to uh, explain the model. Uh, and the, the reason for the, for the name, for this building block. So the main assumption of the model is that a complex flow can be divided into regions whose physics resemble that of a simple canonical flow. What does this mean? When you see the flow over an aircraft, there are many things going on. For example, here in the, ju in the juncture between the wing and the body, you are going to have three boundary layers. Uh, in the train nets, you may have a separation region. Uh, you may have shock waves during cruise, uh, transition to, uh, from laminar to turbulent. All these effects may not be happening at the same time, but they are eventually going to happen at some point. But if you just take a very small region, for example, here in the separation, it's likely going to resemble some more simple canonical case. So for example, here the region of separation is probably going to be uh, similar to an attached flow with an adverse pressure gradient that is going to make this flow reversal. So the idea of the model is that if I build a model such that for any point in the flow, it's able to say this with the information in this point, the flow looks like one of these, they call building blocks. Then I can say, OK, this flow looks like this, and I know the eddy viscosity that I need. Then overall, I'm going to get the right solution. Of course, this is going to work as long as I have my model knows enough building blocks. If I don't have a shock wave, in my building blocks, and my model never seen that, when I have a, a shockwave, probably it's going to fail. So the idea is that by increasing the number of building blocks that your model knows, it's going to be able to have a model that works uh, in a more complex uh, geometry. OK? So this is the idea, and this will be like an schematic of how the, the model works. So I'm running a simulation of my aircraft. Here I have a typical LES grid. 
And at every point, I take the information, which is basically going to be the velocity or whatever is happening in this cell. I'm going to input in my model, which is only a function that takes the input information and is going to give me the eddy viscosity. And to build this model, as I explained to you before, and this box is important, this model has been trained. It's going to be a data-driven model. So I'm going to build it based on the information of only these canonical cases or any case that I want to include, but they are simple cases. So the model has, uh, hasn't been trained with data from uh, an aircraft, okay? Because I want my model to be general as, to be as, general as possible, okay? Uh, so now I'm going to get into this part of how can I build my, uh, my, model, my model to take this information into account. And in particular, what I'm going to use are going to be artificial neural networks. Uh, they are the simplest one. They are fit forward neural networks. I just want my, ner my networks to be basically the fitting to a function. So a neural network can be, uh, you can use it as a fitting, uh, as a universal fitting to a function. So that's the only reason why we are using neural networks. And for this version of the building block flow model, that I'm going to call BFM because it's shorter, I'm going to have three, uh, three functions. I'm going to have two functions for the circuit scale model and one function for the wall model. Uh, in particular, for the world model, this work has been already previously done by Adrian, so I'm going to focus on the circuit scale model, but the, what I'm going to be explaining is also applies to, to that part, okay? So for the circuit scale model, I have two functions. One is for all the points that are not touching any bond the boundary, and I have a different function for the points that are in contact with the wall. In both cases, for the circuit scale model, the inputs are going to be the invariance of the gradient velocity tensor at that uh, grid point. The invariance, they are just functions. They have five invariants, and they are just functions of the rate of strain tensor S and the rate of rotation <laughs> tensor R. And for the case, for the function of the points that are touching the wall, I'm also including the relative velocity parallel to the wall. Uh, I'm use the, I, I use the same velocity to compute the wall shear stress and uh, also I input it for the wall model, the normal distance. Okay. The reason of using these quantities is that then I achieve, uh, my model is Galilean invariant and is invariant under rotation. Uh, the invariants that you may guess they are invariant. So the idea is that if I have a model that works for a channel flow that goes in the horizontal direction, and then I uh, run a channel flow, but just, you know, in the vertical direction, the model is invariant under this rotation, so it's going to work. If I train a model that knows that X is the horizontal direction, then if I run the channel in the vertical direction, the model is going to say, no, but this is the vertical velocity. I don't know what to do. So it has to be invariant. And just a very brief uh, overview of how the, the shape of the neural networks, uh, they are relatively small. There are 10 layers, uh, approximately, with 16 to uh, 12 uh, neurons per layer. And one thing, and the, the wall model is uh, the previous version, which has six layers, 14 neurons per layer. This is something that is not fixed, okay? So we are actually playing with that and see how can we get uh, better performance. And one thing that I'm not gonna uh, talk much about, but it's actually very important, is the non-dimensionalization non of your inputs and your outputs. Uh, and they, they must be things that are uh, local quantities. The, so basically here, we are using a characteristic velocity, which is the function of the invariant and the laminar viscosity, and a characteristic length that is basically the size of the, of the grid. We are not using any geometry uh, or velocity that depends on the, on the channel. For example, like the free stream velocity, because it's something that your model, when you have the aircraft, is, you are not gonna have, or the height of the channel. So you have to use quantities to non-dimensionalize that are local to the, to the grid, to the point, okay? So now the next step is to uh, find these functions, these neural networks. If you are familiar with neural networks, you know that they are just basically uh, some matrix multiplications and the weights of these matrices are the ones, are the things that you are gonna optimize. And to optimize that, what you wanna do is to solve this optimization problem where you minimize the difference between the eddy viscosity that you are getting where you are input the invariance and the eddy viscosity that you want. And now here the question is, what is the eddy viscosity that I want? Well, if you remember, uh, what, I, what we wanted to match was the average shear stress and the mean velocity profile. So for the circuit scale model, my optimum training eddy viscosity 
this thing, with the, the one that I'm going to use to train my neural network, has to be such that when I run a simulation, I get the right velocity profile. So what I do here is that I have these building blocks that have been computed using high fidelity training data. In particular, I'm using uh, simulations, uh, dynamical simulations, but you can also uh, get data from experiments. And of this high quality training data, I get one case. For example, this will be the channel flow at a given Reynolds number. And what I do is to compute, which is the average velocity profile, which is only a function of y, right? OK, and now for this case, what I'm going to do is to run an LEA simulation and perform an optimization problem. And what is important, this part is probably the trickiest one. What is important to notice here is that this LES in this part, the BFM is not being used at all. Okay? I'm just doing this thing to compute this optimum viscosity and then being able to get my model. So here, this LES is a standard LES, okay? where the heavy viscosity, I'm basically at every point, at an every, at, at an every time instant, I'm computing the eddy viscosity from the Bremen model, that if you remember was one of these classical circuit scale model, and I apply in a correcting factor. This correcting factor is k, and it's only a function of the vertical distance, and what I'm going to do is to pick uh, random values for this k vector. I run my simulation, I compute the mean velocity profile of this case, the channel flow, and I see how how uh, how close it is to the uh, solution uh, to the mean velocity profile obtained from DNS, and then uh, based on this, I optimize this. You know, I, I just perform a, a optimization loop, a optimization loop to find which is the optimum k that is going to give me this optimum training eddy viscosity. This is done for a single case. You have to do for all the building blocks and all the cases. You and then what you get, you are snapshots where you have find you have found this optimum eddy viscosity and the invariance that you have used. And with this snapshot for all the cases, then what you do is to train your neural network, minimizing this. Okay, so there's like two steps. First, you need to find this optimum eddy viscosity and then you train the model. And once your model is trained with all these cases, you implement it in your uh, algorithm and you just run this these uh, neural networks that they are just functions. Uh, just some details about the optimization. We are using a nonlinear optimizer. It's a Bayesian optimizer. Here you see an animation on how the optimizer works. It was developed by Pelican. Uh, on the right, you see a target function. This will be the maximum point, and this will be the variables. Imagine if my k uh, vector was only two variables, it will be like the x and the y axis. And what the algorithm is doing is basically sampling random points and trying to approximate how the original target function uh, looks like. For uh, running the alias, uh, I'm using a solver that is called Charles. Charles is a finite volume solver developed by Stanford and Cascade. And the reason of using this solver is because it's the same solver that I'm going to use later on to run my uh, real cases. So in this way, I'm compensating for the numerical errors. Because uh, I'm using Charles, uh, which is computing the invariance using some derivatives depending on the structure. And when I'm running the case, I'm going to have the same numerical scheme to compute those invariants. And the grids, they are isotropic grids. They look like this. And they are typically like from uh, 5 to 10 points per bondi layer, which is given by this delta. And the reason of having these coarse grids is because if I train my model with these coarse grids, when I, when I implement it uh, in a real case, I'm going to be accurate for this grid resolution. The idea now is to have finer grids so such that our model is able to uh, have like uh, finer uh, account for these fine, fine grids. Okay, so I train my model and I'm just gonna show some uh, applications. The first one is the high leaf CRM. So this is a model aircraft. Okay, here we are running experiments. The Reynolds number based on the core is 5 million and the Mach number is 0 0.2, so almost uh, incompressible. And for this, uh, this experiment, they run like, with different angles of attack. They extract a lot of data. And you cannot see it, uh, but the, the flap is deflected. So this corresponds to a high leaf configuration. Basically, it's, la it's landing, and your flow is detached in the trainnets. And it's a challenging case for a CFD model. So it's a good uh, benchmark case. 
And what I'm going to do is to compare what I call here standard LES and the BFN model. And I'm going to compare both of them against the experiments. For the standard LES, I'm going to use as a, as a grid scale model the dynamic Smagorinsky model, and for the wall model, the equilibrium wall model. And for BFM, uh, I'm only going to consider a single building block, which is the channel flow at different Reynolds uh, number. The reason of only considering one uh, building block is, was, is because this was actually a proof of concept. We developed the idea and we want to test it and see, OK, let's see if uh, there is some promising result that we can get out of this new model. Um, here you just see uh, an overview of the computational setup, just very briefly. I have a hemisphere, uh, the, I have half of the aircraft, which is attached to the flat uh, to the, the flat region, where I have a symmetry boundary condition. And then the upstream half of the hemisphere has an inflow boundary condition with a given angle of attack. And in the downstream half of the, of the domain, I impose the non-reflective uh, characteristic boundary condition. And at the bottom, what you can see is um, how the, grease, uh, the, sorry, the grid looks like. It's a, a slice of the wind. You can see different uh, levels of refinement. And the important quantity here is this 30 million. This is the number of grid points of the simulation, the total number of grid points. And it's basically what you can run right now uh, within, like in the industry, is what they can afford. But for a standard, for a standard LDS, usually you need like over 100, uh, well, more than actually was almost 500 or even more, like an insane number of grid points to actually match the, the results. OK? Um, here is just a visualization. It's the same visualization from the very beginning. This was obtained with the BFM. And as I mentioned, it was a proof of concept. So we were actually happy that the flow looks like something reasonable. Like, it's OK, it's not doing anything crazy. So uh, we were very happy about it. But OK, let's get more into a quantitative results. Here I'm showing uh, the leaf coefficient, the drag coefficient, and the pitching moment as a function of the angle of attacks, of the angle of attack. Uh, notice here that the pitching moment, the angle of attack is on the y-axis. This is just because uh, this is usually done. Uh, the black line corresponds to the experiment. The blue circles are the results from the standard LES, and the uh, orange squares are the results from BFM. And I'm going to focus first on the standard LES. And in particular, for uh, I'm showing only two angles of attack, uh, 7 degree and 20, which is where you have the separation and the stall. And one thing that you can notice is that the standard LES for the 7 degrees is giving you the right lift coefficient and the right drag coefficient. So it's like, oh, this is already working. And this, ca this case was interesting because you are getting the right result because of the wrong reason. So what happened here with LES is that uh, the integral of the forces is correct, by the but the distribution of those forces is wrong, what is what you can see here in the pitching moment. So basically, you are over-predicting and under-predicting the pressure at different points in your aircraft, such that you are getting the good total forces, but the pitching moment is off. So this was a case that Boeing was really interested in. The second one, uh, when you, and here you can see that as you increase the angle of attack, the standard LES is not working anymore. You are under-predicting the maximum lift, and your pitching moment is totally off. Compared to that, BFM, taking into account that it's only been trained with channel flow, is doing a I will say like a very good job. We were uh, surprised. We are uh, slightly off for the leaf and the drag in the pitching moment, consistently with, uh, with in the low angle of attack region. And for the high angle of attack, we are doing very well for the maximum leaf coefficient. The drag is overpredicted, and the pitching moment is also a little bit overpredicted, but is way better than the than the result from LES. So as a first, as a proof of concept, we were actually really hap uh, happy. Um, I think I'm just going to probably skip this. You also plot the, the pressure coefficient. Here you have uh, different sections of the wind, so very quickly. Uh, the crosses are the experimental results. And what we saw is that the major difference between the standard LDS and the BFM, well, in both cases, you get something reasonable. But the main difference was here in the region where the standard LES was predicting a separation, BFM was actually closer to the experimental results. So this is just going to go quickly through it. So 
this was the first step, and we say, okay, let's try different cases, let's keep improving the model and see what we can do. Uh, so the next example is the Gaussian bump. Now you are going to see that this case is comparatively simple than the full aircraft, but it's good because we can get more details and more insight into what is actually going on. So the Gaussian bump was a, a benchmark developed by Boeing together with the University of Notre Dame, has this kind of smooth body. Uh, it's a three-dimensional bump. Uh, the length of the bump is L. And this case is uh, good to test uh, CFD models because the separation here you are going to have in the downstream region of the bump, you are going to have a separation. But since your body is smooth, you don't know which is the point where you are going to have the separation. So you have a sharp edge. You know that the separation is going to happen in the sharp region, sorry, in the, in the corner. You don't know whether the attachment is going to happen. With a smooth body, you are going to have a separation bubble that you don't know where it's going to reattach and you don't know where it's going to start. So it's good for CFD models. The Reynolds number based on the width of the bump is 2 million and the Mach number is equal to 0 0.2. So again, almost incompressible. And I'm going to do the same. Basically, I'm going to compare the standard LES with the BFM. And in this case, what I included are um, an, an additional building block, which is the Poisson Quet flow. If you are not familiar with this flow, it's similar to the uh, channel flow. I have this wall that is fixed, but what I do is I have this moving wall that is going to move at a constant velocity, and then I impose a pressure gradient in the opposite direction. By changing the pressure gradient, what I'm going to get is different velocity profiles. If the pressure gradient is very high, I'm going to have a flow reversal. Okay? For the channel flow, the cases are as before, different Reynolds number. And for the Poisson Quet flow, I'm going to have two different versions. In the first version, I included these three velocity profiles. So they are like milled uh, pressure gradients. Uh, here you even have some separation. And what we did is to include uh, in a second version more cases. In this, this velocity, I'm sorry I didn't mention, but this is basically the velocity, the horizontal velocity the mean horizontal velocity as a function of the, ver of the vertical coordinate. Okay, this is the, the bottom wall. And here what you have uh, in the second version, we add these three additional cases with a high shear. Okay, and notice that in both the BFM version one and two, we're always taking into account also the, the attached flow. Okay, um, now I'm going to show the, the evolution of the forces. Here you see the pressure coefficient and the friction coefficient as a function of the stringwise uh, uh, direction in the plane of symmetry of the bump. The white dots are the experiments. The blue line is the dynamic Smagorinsky, and the red and green are the first and the second version of the BFM. Uh, starting with the, with the pressure coefficient, here if you see the experiments, this bump that you see here actually corresponds to the region where the flow is separated. Okay, you, you can measure it in the pressure uh, with the pressure coefficient. And what you notice, and sorry, let me just go back a little bit. I forgot to mention here. This is the size of the grid uh, that we are using. It's a coarse grid. Okay, so this is actually a, a chip simulation where we know that the dynamic Smagorinsky, sorry, the standard LES fails. Okay, so with this uh, resolution, the uh, standard LEAs, you see the blue line, fails to capture the separation. So you almost see no separation. The red line, which is the first version of BFM with only a couple of uh, the Poisson Quet cases, is doing a better job here, but still doesn't match exactly. And when we include more cases of separation, what you see is that uh, the green line is actually getting closer. You are paying a price here, and is that uh, is the maximum a uh, peak here in the apex of the of the Gaussian bump is lower for this second version, and it's because you have the same net and you are having more cases. So now your function is more complex and is not doing as well at some region. This is something that we are working on and we can discuss later on. But overall, the region that we are interested in, and that's the reason we include more cases, was the separation, and then we see that actually we improve in that part. And for the friction coefficient, upstream the bump, none of them are doing particularly well. But here, downstream the bump, where the separation is happening, you see that, the, again, the, uh, the standard LES is not doing a very good job. Here, this zero means uh, zero uh, means when the friction coefficient is negative. So this tells you when the separation and the recirculation start. And here you can see that for the standard LES, it's very small. 
whereas both of the BFN mod models do a very good job. In particular, the green line is matching the, the experiments. Here in this table, you can see the, the point where the separation and the reattachment starts. Uh, these are the experimental ones, and what you can see, BFM is actually doing a pretty good, uh, good job with the uh, prediction of the reattachment point, and is also getting close to the to the separation point. So we are still working on this case, but we already have promising results, improving considerably on uh, sorry on this uh, compared to uh, standard LES. And just to finish, I'm going to give you a more qualitative view of the flow. Here I'm showing the velocity profile in the region where the separation is happening. These gray lines are for a station where I'm showing the experimental uh, velocity. And now I'm using the same colors to show the uh, velocity profile that we obtain with the three methods. So for the standard LES, uh, the blue line, you see that is completely off. The first version of BFM is improving everywhere with respect to the standard LES. And we're very surprised because basically the last version of BFM is doing a, a very good job uh, matching the, the results from the, from the experiments. So this is uh, all. This is the overview of what I've been working on. And I just want to draw some conclusions. So we have developed this BFM. It's a unified it's a grid and wall model in which we devise our flow as a collection of blocks. We have used neural networks to implement it. We have already uh, used it and tested in complex geometries, uh, which are relevant for industrial application. And we actually have shown improvements compared to uh, the methods that have been, uh, been used. And as a next step, we have still to have to still improve the model, account for uh, more flows. And one additional thing is to add uh, what is called the confidence indicator. So basically, as I mentioned, we are having these building blocks. So the idea is that at every point, we would like to know if uh, the flow resembles any of the flows of the building blocks that we have, such that if we are getting a value that doesn't make sense, we can know that, oh, it's because we are missing this building block, or it's because it's thinking that this building block should be that one, but it's another one. So these two things are the things that my group is working uh, working on right now. So that's all. I think I made 35 minutes. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I will be happy to answer.